Randy's coming to the front. Randy, you're going to do the opening prayer. Reggie, you're going to do it? Okay. As Reggie makes his way to the microphone for our opening prayer, there are two prayer requests that I would like to share. The first prayer request is with regard to uh, Delegate Walter Brinsma. Walter has gone by ambulance to the hospital with a condition that appears to be a fibrillation. Uh, he has had that condition before. At times it's not as severe, but at this time it was indicated it was severe enough that he needed medical attention, needed to be taken to the hospital. So we would like to have prayer for Delegate Walter Brinsma. And uh, then also this note came in that at approximately 4.45 uh, Central Standard Time, the home of Marv and Chris Radenius, um, and they are members of Wright CRC, Classes North Central Iowa of Belmond, Iowa, uh, was destroyed in a tornado. And more damage has occurred throughout the town. The extent of the damage is unknown. I believe this note is passed on by Reverend Daniel Lindley, uh, pastor. Dan, uh, William? William Wilton, class of Columbia. Uh, I also received a prayer request a little, just a little bit ago from my sister who lives in Monument, Colorado, and I know this is the case for another delegate or a friend or family member of a delegate. Uh, her home and her family have been evacuated due to wildfires uh, just this afternoon, and so there's uh, natural disasters in the Colorado area that are threatening my family, and I, I, I believe another uh, delegate's family here as well. So uh, if you could remember that in prayer as well. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, it is by your grace that we are here today. Nothing that we've done, and we thank you for watching over us. But Lord, also our hearts goes out to others who are experiencing tremendous burdens and tremendous tragedies. Lord, we lift up Hank to you, and we know that as he has gone to the hospital with experiences of some fibrillation, we ask that you would now be with him and be with the doctors and the nurses and all those who will be involved in his care and also for his family as they wait for news on him. We pray that you would touch him and bring relief to him. We also lift up the couple who has lost their home through a tornado in Iowa. Lord, we know that there are also other victims who are probably a part of that. We pray that you would bring people to be near to them and to surround them, to bring comfort and care, that maybe the hands and feet of Jesus would be shown to them. Lord, we also think of the fires that are happening in Colorado, of families and loved ones and who are being moved from their homes because of these fires. We pray that you will be with all the officials and all the people who will be involved in putting out those fires. We pray that you will give them safety as well and members of our congregations in the Christian Foreign Church who may be involved in that. Lord, we also ask that you also give us wisdom tonight as we grapple with hard issues, tough issues. Give us a spirit of discernment. Give us a spirit of wisdom. And also give us a spirit of humility as we grapple with these issues to further your kingdom. We know that we can't do a thing without you. Come, Lord Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to return to a discussion of Advisory Committee 3B. It's going to take a, a moment to kind of sketch the overview of where we are in this discussion. 
We've had quite a number of speakers already before we broke for dinner, and um, at one point we cut off the speaker list and reserved the names of those who were on the list, and that list includes, I believe, nine names at present. This discussion has the potential to become very complicated if we start talking about amendments and uh, that type of thing, or it, be, it has the potential to be just somewhat complicated. It's not going to be simple. Uh, that's obvious. But we can make it very complicated, or we can make it, I think, manageable. And in the interest of just clarity, and that's part of our responsibility up front here, is to just try to keep things clear and see the options. And um, these comments have nothing to do with steering a conversation in one direction or another, but just to, just to clarify the options, the procedure, the structure, I'm going to make a few comments. Uh, there are two interconnected recommendations that will be, for, be before us. Essentially, they come down to this. One recommendation asks for a study committee. And the second recommendation describes a mandate for a study committee. Now, there's a logic that if the first recommendation fails, the second recommendation for a mandate is moot. You don't need a mandate. I need to tell you that two delegates have proposed recommendations to amend the mandate. We haven't talked about that yet. There have been some tangential discussions, but uh, we've all kind of honored the request to focus on the question of whether to have a study committee rather than to go into the question of mandate. Oh, there have been some overlap, but we've kind of focused on that first question, whether or not a study committee. Uh, the motions that we have received in writing uh, follow proper procedure. If you want to amend a recommendation, you can give a motion, etc. Now, both of those recommendations to amend what's being proposed for a study committee mandate would significantly change the mandate of the study committee. We are not going to rule them out of order, but we want to be able to hear what is in the proposals in a way that is fair, in a way that puts the picture in front of us, and follows proper procedure. So this is the situation. We have nine more speakers. We will decide whether or not to have a study committee. If that recommendation passes, we will enter into the discussion of the mandate for the study committee. If it doesn't pass, we don't need to talk about the mandate. If it passes, we have, in essence, three options. The first option would be the mandate as proposed by the advisory committee, which you have before you. And then there would be a second option, which is a motion from the floor, and a third option, which is a motion from the floor. If we get there, if that becomes the question, what we will do is we will read the recommendation and grounds from the advisory committee, which is option number one for a mandate. Then we will read the second option, which is a motion from the floor. And we will read the third option, which is a motion from the floor. We will understand the difference between each of those three mandates. And then we will give precedence to the recommendation from the advisory committee. 
and the discussion will carry on from there. I trust that that makes it clear. I trust that you will not be saying uh, procedurally, how will this work and will we have a chance to talk about this and various options about mandates, a bigger mandate or a, a smaller mandate or a sm or smaller yet, okay? So um, this is a way that we can, in an orderly way, uh, a, a structured way that honors the concerns of everyone, first have the discussion whether in principle Synod wants a study committee. And if the answer to that happens to be yes, then we will talk about mandate and there will be a fair way to consider the options. Point of order, George? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I spoke before, I asked permission to introduce after a uh, reasonable discussion a motion to, re to recommit this to the committee to change both parts, the, in, the grounds uh, calling for a new committee and the, um, and the mandate of the committee thinking that it might be better to have the advisory committee redo it than try to do it on the floor. Um, and then I sent that to the, to the clerks Will, will I have a chance to offer that in this process? Uh, that, George, is one of the uh, recommendations to revise the mandate as we understand it, okay? Because it really uh, pertains to the mandate rather than in principle whether to have a study committee. So, uh, yes, your recommendation from the floor is one, and the other came, I believe, from Yo. Yo, Scout. Yes. Okay. No? Thank you. Oh, that was something else then. Um, Sean Baker. Now mine also referred to uh, would have implication for the grounds for whether to have a committee or not, but if you don't judge that the grounds there prejudge the mandate of the committee, I'm satisfied with that. Okay. So that, that was just for clarification because this could get very, very complicated or it could just get complicated and complicated is probably good enough so we are now at our speaker list I'm going to read off that list uh, if you've decided over dinner that you don't need to speak anymore or if you or if you recognize in this conversation that you were really actually going to step forward to speak about mandate rather than the whether or not to have a study committee, you can also remove your name. The names that I have are Chad, Mick, uh, I have Mick and then Rick. Okay, Mick has already removed his name. Thank you. So it would be Chad, Rick, Bruce, Jeff, Paul, Tim, Victor, Grace. Tim removed his name as well. Victor as well. Okay. 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 Chad, Rick, and Bruce. I'm also getting new names, and once again, I'm going to be firm. Uh, we are not accepting new names, nothing personal. We've been uh, consistent with that all along. If we cut off the speaker list, we do not accept any names, not even for fundraising goals. <laughs> Chad, and then Rick, and then Bruce. Oh. Chad Heisinger, Young Adult Representative, Ileana Classis. Um, just a few statistics first. 23% um, of the CRC members were not born, uh, were born, sorry, were born after 1973, and 60% were under the age of 20 in 1973. Um, those will be relevant. I, it won't be too long, so don't worry. Um, I'm basically, I think what I'm representing is um, a group of young people who were in the middle ground, were confused, 
and we don't really know what to do about this whole issue. Um, and we agree, I agree with parts of what the CRC said in 1973, other parts I don't agree with, uh, and I think we have some good, we have some good reasoning for that. So, I, basically what I'm trying to say is, I want us to talk and discuss things anyway. I know on Twitter, Twitter someone said, whenever you say the word study committee, you replace that with the words $36,000. If I had $36,000 for a study committee, I would consider giving it all for it. I don't even have $1,000 to my name right now, so sorry, I can't help you with that. But I think that it is so important for us to have a study committee on this issue because, like I said, 60% of the CRC denomination was under the age of 21 or not even born when this decision was made. And even if we come to the exact same conclusion as 1973, it's not money wasted because I think it's our generation saying is we, we don't want to, we want to have our own say and have our own thing about this. We studied it as our generation and we decided that this is what our generation says, even if it's the exact same thing. Our generation said it, not our grandparents. We're not believing what our grandparents said for the sake of, that's what our grandparents said. It's the same reason. Do I believe that the Bible is true because my grandparents say it is? I believe the Bible is true because I said it is, and I believe that. So I think that we need, we definitely need to restudy this because our generation needs to consider this and figure it out ourselves. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rick Van Manen. I'm with Classis Alberta North and a campus minister at the University of Alberta. And I'm in favor of the motion and particularly the pastoral care side of it. Uh, my support is based in part on the story in Genesis 38 in that story, the sin of Judah, which I would describe as neglect or even disregard, you might even say a lack of pastoral care towards Tamar, who represents in the community the members who are the most vulnerable. The sin of Judah is described as greater than that of Tamar, towards which the narrator renders little, if any, judgment. And it's my hope that the study committee that's formed that will, will shepherd us in our work in our local congregations and communities in which we will continually, to hear, continually hear the words of Judah ringing in our ears that she is more righteous than I. Thank you. Bruce? Back in my day, we had a lot more respect for our elders. <laughs> Just want to point out to Synod that Synod had an opportunity two years ago to form a study committee on this very issue along with coming up with biblical, a biblical study on this very issue two years ago. And two years ago, Synod decided not to go ahead with that. Just to let them know that we had this opportunity and I don't think too much has changed in two years. Jeff? I speak against the motion. I believe we can develop pastoral advice without a study committee and without the $36,000, although that's not my primary concern. I think we can accomplish the same thing without another study committee working on it for three years. Paul? Hmm. These overtures, uh, sorry, I tried to write stuff down, so I stay a little... Oh, Oof, Alberta, South Saskatchewan. <laughs> oh, oh man. There, All right, so I'll try to read. Uh, these overtures asked for a lot. Uh, one major focus is on the political and legal issues around same-sex marriage, major in both overtures. I'd submit to this gathering that these particular pieces will likely overlap with religious persecution and liberties as that study committee that we already said yes to thinks about that in the North American context. So and we passed that study committee. 
So I would suggest, and this is where I'm looking for nimbleness of, you know, the body. Uh, I actually would like to suggest that um, what George has suggested is what we do, and this is um, and not later, but now. Um, I'd like to pull together some thoughts from what I think we've talked about so far. First, we've heard many times that the mandate would, um, should be widened to include biblical work. I'm going to stop I, you a minute, Paul. Are, got, are you speaking to recommendation one? No. Yes, yes. Do you? Yeah, I will sound like it as soon as I get to the uh, second to last line. Well, second you to said last. we already passed the recommendation. Uh, for the study committee for religious liberty and freedom okay. uh, and persecution, sorry, right? That study committee. All right. So um, I think we need to expand the, the study of biblical stuff. Uh, the, the vote in 2011, if I remember right from being that synod nerd online, was 82 to 79. So we did decide not to pass it, but it was very close. Um, I think we do have all sorts of new biblical stuff out including in our sister denomination, um, James Bronson's book that I have right there, Bible, Gender, and Sexuality, that I think we need to engage with. And I think we need to engage with that for pastoral reasons, because I think um, our communities need to know what to, how to respond. Okay, so that's um, first. Second, um, I think, so biblical stuff for pastoral reasons, which I think is what's left on those two overtures if you take out the actual religious uh, freedom piece. Uh, we've heard quite clearly that we need to hear from homosexuals in our community and hear their story, that there's confusion among us. We need to listen to homosexuals who have left our community, and I would say that's lots of them. We also need, need to hear from those who have stayed with us, as we've heard already. So for both of those reasons, let me speak to recommendation one. I think what we need is not a study committee, but a shepherding committee, which is what we were spoke we were told is a very helpful committee for us in contentious issues. It focuses on pastoral stuff, which I think is what's left in this overture, um, in my opinion. Uh, so I think we need a shepherding committee, because the difference between a study committee and a shepherding committee, as I understand it, is that the study committee is going to come to us in three years with results. A shepherding committee is going to pastorally, I, I think actually Rick used this word, shepherd us along the way, have conversations with us, help us to listen to the voices of those who are homosexuals among us, those who are homosexuals who have left us, and help us have some sort of empathy towards the justice issues and the biblical issues. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, this is where I wonder, that's where I think George's suggestion is significantly different than waiting until it comes up in recommendation two. George's suggestion to send it back to the advisory council uh, committee and to come back with something that guides us pastorally as a shepherding committee, different than a study committee, uh, through this conversation. Because, as was said earlier, shepherding committees um, are helpful in contentious issues. The final speaker is Victor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Victor Coe from Alberta North. Address the chair, please. Oh, sorry. I speak on f uh, favorably on the recommendation. I was talking with, well, sorry. I fully believe that the studies done back in 1973 and both 2002 are sound and solid and scriptural. There. At the same time, I think we need a password care uh, centered oriented study committee as to how we may deal with gay marriage particularly. We are facing this both culturally but, but also around the world. And I was talking with a young woman from the CRC and I was asking her why are young people leaving the church? And in her response immediately was she, they, they find their church socially too conservative. I said, give one example. Without skipping a beat, she said, gay marriage. Okay? Now, I, I feel confident, confident, that as long as we have the right people on the committee, people who believe in the word of God, it's infallibility, and both uh, those who can exegete and interpret the Bible accurately, I feel very confidently that we will come down with the right results, which will be what we have found back in 2002 and 
1973. But it is good for the young people to be engaged in this. And for that matter, that's a lot of money, $36,000, but I think it warrants the cost. Thank you so much. Okay, that brings us to the end of our list of speakers, those who we had on the list already uh, prior to the C2C presentation. And uh, in just a few seconds, we will be voting. I'm going to ask you to read. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that if, if the uh, chairman proposes a session of debate, that should be sustained by a majority of the, of the assembly. And um, there's been a lot of issues raised about whether we ought to have a study committee. And uh, for one, I, I don't feel like we've exhausted that discussion yet. Okay. Uh, the rule is, is this. If someone moves to cease debate, it's put to a voice. If the president of synod states that we will cease debate, that's what will happen unless the chair is challenged. Th those are the rules. Well, it seems like it's a little more complicated. That I did actually read the rules of synodical order before we came here, um, which doesn't mean that I'm totally pedantic about these things, but. It says the officers of synod may assign a time limit for debate on issues that they think will be debated longer than one hour. This time limit will be announced prior to the presentation of the report. The delegates may vote to extend debate for half hour intervals when the time limit has been reached. When it's believed that the motion under consideration has been debated sufficiently, the president may propose cessation of debate. If a majority of synod sustains this proposal, discussion shall cease and the vote shall be taken. So, I mean, maybe you set a time limit, but you didn't tell us about that. I'm willing to challenge that. I think we could discuss this properly a little bit more. Um, but uh, that's totally fine. We, we can have a voice vote um, to see how many people would like to continue the debate and how many would like to cease the debate to vote on this motion. And I'm, I'm more than happy to entertain that. All in favor of ceasing debate, Please say aye. Aye. Contrary, the same. Aye. That has carried. If you would read the motion. The recommendation is that Senate accede to overtures 12 and 13 by appointing a study committee to report to Senate 2016. The grounds the reports from 1973 and 2002 have served the denomination very well by laying out the biblical principles and the foundations and foundations clearly where read and applied. Nevertheless, they could not take into consideration later political, legal, and social developments. Such developments include legalized same-sex marriage and the significant shifting of public opinion, which also impacts the membership of the denomination. And B, in light of these developments, it is prudent for the denomination to expand the applications of the teachings and conclusions of 1973 and 2002 in order to give guidance and clarification on how members, clergy, and churches can speak prophetically in a loving fashion within North America. Yes. I will grant that. I will rule that. The vote will be electronic. We'll wait for the, uh, just a second. Are they already voting? Okay, well, I, before you vote, I just want to make sure that there's absolute clarity in terms of what yes and no means, okay? If you vote yes, you agree that Synod accede to Overture 12 and 13 by appointing a study committee. If you vote no, then you vote against Synod acceding to Overture 12 and 13 to appoint a study committee. It's clear? Okay. Go ahead and vote. No, if you voted and you voted correctly, don't change your vote.
It's not even in charter. Okay, that's closer. Yeah, just leave it open. the Church's members and clergy regarding the ramifications of the legal, ethical, and spiritual issues that they face and identify resources and best practices that will facilitate ministry and directly communicate them to the churches. I so move, Mr. Chairman. That motion is moved and supported, and now, as per previous discussion, it's going to be tabled so that we can hear for information two motions from the floor that deal with mandate that are different from this. If you could put up, first of all, the proposed amendment that is proposed by Delegate Sean Baker from Grand Rapids North. I'm going to give this to our Vice President to read. If you would go to the... Proposed an amendment to a recommendation. The subject expanded the mandate for the Study Committee on Homosexuality. The proposed recommendation that Senate adopt the following mandate for the proposed study committee. The study committee will give guidance and clarification on how members, clergy, and churches can apply relevant biblical teaching, including the teaching reflected in the Acts of Senate 1973, Report 42, in light of the legalities of same-sex marriage in certain jurisdictions, as well as how to communicate these teachings in a truthful and gracious way within North America to reevaluate the biblical teachings relevant to homosexuality, human sexuality, and marriage, address questions on the same-sex marriage, including but not limited to those in Overture 12 and 13, and lastly, identify and guide the churches, members, and clergy regarding the ramifications of the legal, ethical, and spiritual issues they face. Continue, next page. Yeah. And then identify the resources and best practices that will, be, that will facilitate ministry and directly communicate them to the churches. The grounds for amending the, the mandate. There is suspicion that if our denomination reevaluates the relevant biblical teaching, the conclusions of Senate 19, 19, 1973 would be challenged or overturned. The best way to confront this suspicion is to reevaluate the relevant biblical teaching. And second, since 1973, with increasing frequency recently, recently. Many Reform and Christian Reform members, theologians, and pastors have articulated arguments which challenge the conclusions of Senate 1973. These arguments are considered compelling by many in our denomination. Delegate Sean Baker, classes, Grand Rapids North. Okay, for, for clarity, please go back to page one. I'd like to call to your attention the fact that this page is essentially the same as that of the advisory committee with the exception 
of the first bullet point, re-evaluate the biblical teachings relevant to homosexuality, human sexuality, and marriage. The grounds, of course, are different at the end for revising, but this line is the essentially different component, expanding the mandate. Okay? We've received this for information. Now, um, if our first clerk, Lauren Veldheisen, would read the next proposed amendment. Proposed recommendation. If you wait, wait a second, Lauren, until we can pull it up on the screen. Okay. To recommit Advisory Committee 3B1 to the Advisory Committee with instruction to revise the responses to overtures 12 and 13, to expand the mandate of the study committee to include a re-examination of the biblical evidence and examination of current psychological and biological scholarship regarding homosexuality. Okay, and this is a proposed motion from George Monsman, Jr., Grand Rapids East. I call your attention to this detail. The request is to recommit for the purpose of expanding the mandate to include a re-examination of the biblical evidence and examination of current psychological and biological scholarship regarding homosexuality. It becomes complicated to compare those three, but it might be helpful in your mind to think of it this way. The advisory committee has a mandate like this. The next one adds to re-examine biblical evidence and interpretation. And the third one suggests recommitting so that the mandate would come back to add not only the biblical interpretation, but also current psychological and biological scholarship. Okay, that'll help you to keep those three <coughs> options, positions in mind. The last two have been received for information. Precedence is being given to the advisory committee. Take that back onto the table for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to point out on behalf of the advisory committee, and I spoke with several of our members uh, over supper, that we crafted this mandate with great respect to the overtures that generated the recommendation. And the overtures that generated the recommendation said that they wanted to honor the 73 report particularly, and also made some reference to the 2002 report, which was in its nature a little bit different because it sort of expanded in terms of uh, some evaluatory or applicatory uh, aspects. But we, we try to honor the intent of the overtures, and the overtures certainly did not ask us uh, to go to where the other two, I think, amendments are, uh, are bringing us. Uh, just notice on uh, page 419, um, at the very, the very last uh, line prior to the uh, line that's uh, reduced print type, where they say, we do not wish to challenge or replace the 1973 report in any way, but ask for guidance on how to apply the report's conclusions in these new situations. So that's what uh, governed our uh, committee, because we thought we uh, were there to provide um, uh, advice with regard to what the overtures were asking for, and that's why we proposed this particular mandate. Okay, this motion is before us. It has been duly moved and supported. We have a speaker list that's beginning uh, and beginning to grow. Uh, Stephen, then Tim, Jason, Nick, Alcha. Oh, yes. Let me respectfully suggest that things have changed in the last two years. Uh, laws have changed, opinion has changed, but even more has changed in the last 40 years. I think we cannot be slaves as a synod, the pinnacle of the church meeting, specifically to an overture when 
the substance of the question at hand is so critical and so important to us as Christians. We also shouldn't put our heads in the sand in 1973 because so much has changed. There is new psychological evidence. There are new legal. There are all sorts of ramifications to this question. If we have the courage of our convictions as Christians, we should have the courage to look at an issue completely and thoroughly. We shouldn't backpedal on this. Let's take a solid, good look at everything involved in this issue and have the courage to look at it as Christians. Thank you. Tim? Tim Bossenbrook, Clap. Tim Bossenbrook. Raise it up. There you go. Tim Bossenbrook, Class of Chicago South. I speak, I think, uh, in favor of the uh, motion, but I want to get to uh, my colleague Paul's place, uh, a shepherding approach. When I was here, I, I hear the, the dire need to look at the uh, biblical interpretation and, and all of that, uh, especially from our young adult representatives, and I have a lot of sympathy for that. Uh, when I was here at Synod, I think my first time, uh, we looked at the Bioethics Study Committee, which was a, to give advice, pastoral advice, on issues such as uh, in vitro fertilization. What happened on the Synod floor were debates about what statements the Christian Reformed Church should come out on uh, in terms of when does life begin? Uh, is in vitro fertilization right or wrong? Um, pastoral care is a messy issue, and the, the, those statements can be helpful, um, but that debate took away from the central core of the report, which was pastoral care. We uh, Reformed folk like to think that if we get our thinking straight, everything else will follow. Um, I would suggest that let's begin by reviewing what we're doing in terms of pastoral care. Are we doing well? What, what kinds of things are people doing? How is that going? What can we do better? And then out of that, let's address, if revisit the, the, the biblical interpretation and, and so forth. Um, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Jason. <clears throat> Jason John from uh, Classes Pacific Hanmi. I think the study committee, as uh, the gentleman said, will focus on uh, that. Yeah, we sh and we should yeah, focus on shepherding. Yeah, pastoral guidance, and so when I saw that the uh, advisory committee recommendation is focused on application of uh, what we know, what we have already studied and uh, have uh, conviction, uh, but I thought uh, kind of recently is so many different uh, developments like a legal and uh, scientific development, so for contemporary society, I mean, in this society, what we should do say to that, that kind of issue, especially for the young people. I totally agree with that, but at the same time, I want to say that uh, uh, we, when we talk about social development and many uh, cultural matters, I remember that uh, that German uh, theologian Rudolf Bultmann saying, "How can a first-century worldview and, and all the record and teachings based on that worldview, resurrection, miracle by Jesus Christ, virgin birth, all those things? How can we 
believe that 20th century man of uh, science. So we have to demystify everything so that 20th century people can accept that, that teaching. Uh, I think what we are doing, I mean, uh, based on that, that kind of a thing, we have to change that. Uh, to me, what is very clear and very uh, definite teaching of the Bible, uh, try to adapt to that, that kind of understanding and uh, that kind of uh, social development. I worry, I have a deep worry about that. And uh, I, we talk, the Korean pastors talk over dinner about that issue. And uh, I don't know about the other ethnic groups, but uh, kind of a, we just follow the society. I think uh, with this considerable certainty, I, 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 I think uh, I, I can say this, we have to maybe leave the denomination. But uh, I, I'm, I hope and uh, I'm confident that the study committee kind of uh, does not conclude that way. And when I hear, uh, one more thing I want to say, when I hear this kind of a thing again and again, I cannot help but uh, remind me, I mean, remind of the passage, biblical passage of uh, Genesis 3. Did God really say so? Thank you. Nick. Nick Monsma, Classes Atlantic Northeast. Uh, I've proposed an amendment to the uh, recommendation, uh, uh, the mandate. Um, did you receive that? I do have it in front of me. Um, so I'd like to move that amendment if I could right now. Unfortunately, when I send it, it disappears from my computer. Um, so is it possible for somebody else to read it? <laughs> I can read it. Um, I'm not quite sure where it exactly fits in. Um, yeah, I was, I was trying to type it fast, so um, I didn't copy the entire text of the the mandate. Um, it would be the last, there were th what, three or four bullet points uh, okay. in the mandate, and this would be a, the final one appended to the end of it. Okay. And uh, now you can read it. All right. And so the, uh, the amendment uh, is that we add the following to the end of the mandate, um, and that the committee, uh, follow the shepherding model of the Faith Formation Committee. Okay, and now the first order is to determine whether or not that is, in fact, what we call a friendly amendment. That's technical language, okay? We're not talking about animosity or non-animosity, but in technical church order language, we need to determine whether this is a friendly emotion, a friendly motion. All of my emotions are friendly. <laughs> Bless you, you're exemplary. Um, we need to determine whether this substantially changes or not the recommendation that is before us. If it substantially changes it, then it's out of order. And ordinarily, we do two things when something like this happens. We look in the direction of the reporter and the chair of the committee. Let me consult with the chair. For yeah, that. you may consult with the chair. Just so that you understand, that's proper procedure. It's also a fairness question because if it substantially changes it, then it should be treated just like the other two recommendations that came in. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, both uh, the, uh, the chair and I agree that uh, under the idea of best practices, right, that this could be seen as a friendly emotion that, or emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Your mistakes our, are catching. Our yes. emotions are just rubbing off on <laughs> yeah, each that's other. That's right. But if, if the shepherding model helps us, it may very well extend the, the life of the committee because Howard Vanderwell talked about not a three-year, but a five- or six-year thing. But if that helps the church, 
then uh, it, uh, we judge it to be a friendly, uh, friendly motion or amendment. <laughs> I'll just stick to the good language. It's amendment. Okay. And now we're going to ask you to vote on the amendment. Right? So the motion is before us to add the following to the mandate. That would be a bullet point. Following the shepherding model of the Faith Formation Committee. Is that seconded? To the amendment only. All in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary the same. Aye. That is carried. Brings us back to our speaker list. Yes? Can we assume that that will apply to the other two amendments? I'll just add, the, the question is asked as a point of order, may we assume that that's automatically done to the other ones too? And the answer is no. We cannot assume that. But you heard how enthusiastic the body was, and you might probably suspect that if it would get to that, they might judge the same way for those. George, you, do, you don't really have the, okay. the privilege oh. of the mic unless if you're asking about a point of order. The question's been answered. Okay. Uh, next speaker is Alcha. Alcha Van Grotes to BC Northwest. This is my first synod, and when I was going through my agenda, I was absolutely delighted to hear that we have young adult representatives here. I have listened to them, and I've heard their comments that this is the major issue that they are dealing with at this time. I think it's a very cheap $36,000 to spend to deal with this issue, but also to deal with it on an expanded basis. I'm voting against the motion as it presently reads, and I'm not sure whether I'm going for one or two. I'd like the wording, the psychological and the bi uh, biological in, in number three, but I hate to send it back to committee for then it to come before us again. But I think we have to listen to our young people. They are leaving us. In, by droves, and they're telling us this is their major issue. We can't bury our heads in the sand. There has been new information. Um, I also appreciate the comments that there's a suspicion that maybe the 73 report, as it presently stands, will, could look different today. I don't think we should be afraid of this issue. I think we should deal with it. We should use the science that God has given us to delve in this as deeply as possible. Thank you. Okay. Next speakers will be Brian, Mike, and David. Just alert the delegates to the fact that we have 25 people on the speaker list. Mr. Speaker, uh, Brian Tebman, Classes Yellowstone. Many of us are aware and watched the uh, debate last year at the RCA Synod. Um, it was not exactly what we are talking about, but it did come up with the issue of homosexuality. And um, there were many comments made, many similar to this body here, um, but one gentleman in particular kind of bridged the gap. And he said, we need to be theologically orthodox and pastorally progressive. And if you have read through the 73 report, and I mean really read through it, it is theologically orthodox. I am proud to be part of a tradition that wrote the thing. But we are not pastorally progressive. We are not. And I say to the young delegates, to everybody else, we need to be pulled and prodded and kicked and cry, and there needs to be anger and forgiveness but we need to be pastoral. So I stick with, I suggest we stick with, I plead, not even sure which action verb to use, that we stick with the recommendations of the committee. We do not accede to these um, 
amendments coming through. I think to, in 2011, East Grand Rapids had a very similar one that was over, overturned. Let's respect the work of the committee. There was no minority report that came with this. No minority report, so let's remember that. Thank you for your time. It's great to be part of God's church, amen. Mike. Following Mike will be David, Cedric, and Larry. I'm gonna ask, please, everybody, um, you know, we got 24 speakers, so keep your comments to the point. Uh, it's helpful if you say, I speak in favor of the motion or against the motion, and um, brief comments. If you feel that someone has already said what you were going to say, you have the option to pass. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Omidema, Classes Zealand. Uh, I speak in favor of the recommendation, uh, particularly because I am from Class of Zealand, and more particularly, I am from uh, the church they originated, Overture 12. Uh, I thank um, Advisory Committee 3 for um, really, I think, capturing the spirit of our original Overture. Um, I thought the first recommendation uh, did exactly what we wanted, and their mandate does exactly what we want in the spirit of what we want. Um, I think that, uh, as Delegate Person Air pointed out earlier and has been seconded since, um, Senate 2012 uh, overturned overtures very similar to what these two um, amendments suggest. Um, I appreciate the friendly amendment to th this proposal or this recommendation. I believe um, rec the, the second mandate weakens a bit. Um, our confidence in the decision of Senate 90, or 73, and um, I believe Mandate 3 is a return to the, the overture of 2011, um, the, the decision of 2011. So again, I speak in favor of the recommendation as proposed by the advisory committee. Thank you. David. Um, David Bosher, class of Thornapple Valley. Um, I speak in, in support of the study committee and therefore against the amendments. And I'll start off by saying that I'm, I'm not evaluating this issue um, in a vacuum. I have several friend, close friends that are struggling with this, two in particular right now who are dealing with same-sex attraction. I'm very close to this, both personally and pastorally. Um, and I also, I've, I've studied a lot of the recent psychological evidence. I'm actually quite familiar with it. Um, I have a psychology professor who struggles with this, who, and we're in dialogue all the time, so I'm quite familiar with that. And I would say I have no trouble um, saying that same-sex attraction can be something that is from birth, and it can be something you struggle with all your life. But I'm reformed, and so I think that sin is something that you can struggle with from birth and struggle with all your life. Um, and my temptations might not change till the grave, uh, but it's what Jesus Christ is, is doing with them. Um, and I, I say that so that you'll, you'll know I mean this. The, in the 1973 report, knowing the psychological evidence, I, I just don't see how any of the new evidence that you could bring, even the edgier stuff, really comes into contact with the 1973 report. Um, the 1973 report is really, really well written in my opinion. Um, next, I would say that if you do open it up to uh, reevaluating the 1973 report, um, I would urge us to abstain from chronological snobbery and simply assuming that because we're 40 years later that we have the best position in history to evaluate on the subject. On the one hand, we do have a lot more psychological and scientific evidence. That is correct. Um, but the culture is also putting a lot of pressure on us, whereas it might not have been in 73. Some people would argue that that means we will be more accurate, but it could also mean that we'll be less and we'll be more towards the culture. So I have a lot of concerns about this. And my, cons my biggest one, and the what reason I'm voting this way, um, is that by reopening the 1973 report, I think it could serve to muddy the waters of the issue now at hand of, of gay marriage. I think it takes away from the sharpness of the actual study to do what it's meant to do. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we have 26 speakers on the list, and I'm going to close the list. So the list of speakers is now closed. 
also going to remind you that if you do the math and 26 times approximately three minutes, a little over three minutes is what our speeches are averaging, that's an hour and a half. Um, if the speeches are two minutes, that brings us out under an hour. If the speeches are one minute, that's a half hour. It's just simple math, okay? Um, next speaker is Cedric. Thank you, very much. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Cedric Parcells, young adult representative. I'll try and make this as brief as possible. Um, it's most definitely true that this is the uh, most important issue facing my, or one of the most important issues facing my generation. Good book, if you're interested on this, is Robert Putnam and David Campbell's American Grace, which makes that point uh, very pointedly. Um, one of the comments that I have heard, and this was brought up at the um, synodical discussion of this back in 2011, um, is that the issues have changed, uh, that the biblical uh, exegesis has developed so much in the last 30, 40 years that it warrants a new study committee on the issue. Um, I just graduated uh, for Princeton Seminary and Calvin Theological Seminary, and I'm not convinced that that's true. Uh, it's a big issue on campus. We talk about it a lot, and I'm not quite sure that that's accurate. Um, Nevertheless, it is an empirically verifiable high, uh, claim. Uh, and so one suggestion I have is that maybe in addition to the stuff that goes on in the study committee, the study committee might be asked uh, to look at the, the tradition of uh, biblical commentary on this issue over the last 40 years and report back to Synod saying, yeah, there's been quite a bit of change in the, in the biblical discussion on this. Or, maybe the positions really haven't changed since 1973 and we're just playing a hermeneutics game. Uh, one, last, one last thing. Um, I, I'd said in an earlier session that I'm a convert to the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, I came out of the Episcopal Church, um, large part because of this issue. And my experience in that church leads me to believe and in my, my experience of the Presbyterian Church USA also leads me to believe this, that this issue will not go away with a new study committee or with a shepherding committee. I think that to be quite blunt, this issue is the women in office issue for my generation. I felt like the conversation in the Episcopal Church was neither healthy nor was it theologically justified? The decisions that were reached were not theologically justified. And so I decided I couldn't do ministry in that church. Thank you. Larry? There have been fewer issue, few issues in the Christian Reformed Church when I have been more proud of the Christian Identify Reformed yourself, Church. Identify yourself, please. Excuse me. Classes. Thank you. Larry Meyer, Classes, Wisconsin. Thank you. There have been few times when I've been prouder of the Christian Reformed Church than in the decision of 73 regarding homosexuality. I found that it spoke with theological boldness in making the distinction between the inclination, which we can rephrase as some might say hardwiring, and the practice. I find that to be pastorally helpful without saying more than I mean to say, there is within each of us, and I speak only as a man, that we tend to be hardwired towards unfaithfulness. The question then is not our wiring, but how do we act out on that which is within us, this inclination towards unfaithfulness. That to me is the heart of what happened in 73. And I see from pastoral experience, and those of you who have been in council rooms know, that drip, 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 don't like the decision, bring it back around again, drip, 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 drip. 
and it tends to come around. And so, yes, indeed, it is the issue that will reappear and reappear. This is not an old versus young issue. It is neither accurate nor fair to say that we don't understand. I wish not to reinforce that concept with this quote, but I believe it is, it says something important to hear. C.S. Lewis has showed me that newness is no virtue and oldness no vice. Truth and beauty, truth and beauty and goodness are not determined by when they exist. Nothing is inferior for being old. Nothing is valuable for being modern. This has freed me from the tyranny of novelty and opened for me the wisdom of the ages. I speak in favor of the recommendation of the advisory committee that it be limited to a pastoral exploration of the implications and a reinforcement of 1973's conclusions. Corey, and then Bruce, and then Joseph. Corey Plackmeyer, Classes Lake Erie. I speak against the motion before us, but perhaps not for the reasons that you expect. I want to express my appreciation to Tim and Paul and their desire for a shepherding and pastorally sensitive model as we address this question. Yet I think we also need to recognize the pastoral dimension of engaging with the biblical arguments that have arisen since 1973, such as the book which Paul has already mentioned. Arguments such as these have given rise to confusion and questions, and leaving those questions unaddressed is actually as pastorally insensitive as to, uh, I don't know where I was going to finish that. <laughs> I believe it is pastorally insensitive. I would also like to note that this is a matter that goes far beyond homosexuality to the whole of what could be called LGBTQQIA. I've heard this called alphabet soup, but I believe we need to remember that underneath each of these letters is a real human person. And by limiting this question to matters of homosexuality alone, we are leaving out a whole range of questions that is also part of this very issue. Bruce? I just want to ask for some clarification. Be I'm Bruce Personaire, Central California, thank you. Clarification uh, is, is that the only way now for us to go to the two uh, uh, alternate recommendations is for us to defeat this motion, and then we can perhaps entertain those two others. Is that as correct because of the cessation of debate and also because you have ruled those two other motions to be significantly different than what is being advised by our, are being recommended by advisory committee, is that correct? The route to get to those would be to vote this down and then uh, go to one of the others, yes. Okay, thank you, and I speak in favor of the recommendation that is before us. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, the motion I made is a standard parliamentary subsidiary motion that would be voted on in normal parliamentary procedure before the vote on the main motion. And um, I am on the speaker's list uh, for the precise um, reason that I wished to move that uh, for consideration of, of this body. The other motion was a motion to amend, and that too would be in order before voting on the main motion. So the, the proper parliamentary procedure would be to take up those motions defeat or pass them, and then uh, go to the main motion that is, if one is left. The motion to amend would only be relevant if it was a friendly amendment and did not substantially alter the recommendation that was before us. So this becomes, in essence, a substitute motion. You cannot amend a motion in such a way that it substantially alters the intent 
of the main motion. Mr. Chairman, on our rules for synodical procedure, on page 16, it says a motion to amend is not a proper motion if it nullifies the main motion or is not germane to it, but the amendment uh, proposed by Sean Baker does not nullify the main motion. It makes a modification in it, and that's, that's the purpose of an amendment, not just to correct a little bit of uh, grammatical structure or something, but to address the same purpose in a somewhat different way. And likewise, my motion to recommit is a motion to address the same purpose, but in a, a somewhat different way. Those are standard ways of, of amending motions in all parliamentary procedure. I'm going to respond to that by saying, uh, as I said earlier, we can make this very, very complicated or just complicated. It is complicated. I acknowledge that. Uh, I think that what we set out at the beginning is a fair way to hear what the options are and the various proposals. Um, the simplest way to proceed with this, which I suggested earlier, is that precedent is given to the recommendation that comes from the advisory committee. If that recommendation is voted down, then you can come to one of the other ones. Uh, I'm going to allow, because of the complexity of this, I'm going to allow one other option. And that other option is that there is a motion to table this in order to consider one of the other proposals. That will test the body, okay? And that is just the absolute fairest way to do this. That will test the body. That way there is no question whatsoever in terms of the intent of the delegates. I didn't want that to happen early because we needed to have the kind of discussion that we are having. But if someone makes a motion to table this for the purpose of moving to one of the others, I will allow that as a legitimate motion. But that's not in the amendment then to this. It's just to table this recommendation to move to the other. Perry. When we get to number 19 and 24, I will make that motion. <laughs> okay. And I'm point not, of information, I would not be surprised Mr. if there are others. So, okay, point of order. Uh, Tom? Is there another option of, if this were to be voted down, could the advisory committee offer on their own to take this back? and come to the floor with another recommendation? If this is voted down, there are X number of options that can still be reality. But, but they would need a vote first before they could take something back. That would have to be, it would have to be recommitted to them or something of that nature for that purpose. Joseph, Phil, Bev. I'm Joseph Byrne uh, of Crisis Hudson in New York. I joined the CRCNA about more than 10 years ago, and I was, and I have been very, very happy and proud of our CRC because the CRCNA is conservative and biblical and reformed. I think many Korean churches uh, feel the same to me like this. Uh, but still, uh, I, I, I'm proud of my denomination, but I'm confused. What's the difference between our denomination and liberal denomination? Uh, I have a very good friend uh, who was a pastor of a uh, very good church, but uh, they belonged to liberal church and they left the denomination because of uh, homosexuality issue last year. I told him, hey, come on, join our CRC, our denomination. You are not the denomination like that liberal church. We are still conservative, 
We believe in Bible is inerrant and the truth is the same in the past, now, and in the future until Jesus Christ, our Savior, is come again. And uh, please don't make me be hesitant to say this word to my friend. And I actually uh, afraid sooner or later this synod will vote for some conservative churches and many Korean churches. The synod will embrace them or kick them out in the future. Please, I love CRC, I love Reformed Church and Conservative Church. Don't kick me out, please. Phil? Yes, I, um, I speak in favor of the advisory committee's recommendation. I speak against this, uh, the uh, substitute motion that's really been placed in front of us. Uh, I'd like to basically say two things. One is that um, my children um, and a number of spouses, uh, eight and seven, um, are not asking these questions, and a number of us, and including myself as a pastor, have uh, gay and lesbian friends, and that's not, uh, this 1973 report is not the, the issue or the question. The question is, how do we, uh, how do we walk with our, um, our, our friends and our parishioners who are uh, wired differently than we are for whatever reason? And... Um, but that's the one part of it. The other part is I'm just having a kind of a difficult time understanding how this particular substitute motion can even be in order or legally before us. Uh, we were advised that uh, we can't have these things that uh, are substantially different or as different in substance. Uh, in, our, in our advisory committee, we were told repeatedly or a number of times that Synod has made this decision. It uh, happened to be about another issue, another matter, of course. That's not up for grabs. And here we have an overture that uh, says very blatantly, very uh, clearly, as uh, Bill Veenstra, also the, the reporter, highlighted that we do not wish to challenge or replace the 1973 report in any way. The same thing was, was underscored by the delegate from, from Zealand. Uh, we've got in, uh, in the, uh, again and again, where it says, you know, 1973, 1981, 1990, there's any number of, of dates there. Uh, so I'm just wondering how this can uh, legally be in order. Uh, churches have not, these classes have not had an opportunity. If we change this and say this is the direction that we want to go, uh, that wasn't what was heard by our churches that wasn't the input that we could receive. This is the, the overture that was before us is that we want and need that pastoral uh, direction. And uh, so, uh, final point, uh, as I understand our church and our church order, uh, organizations, agencies, uh, even synod advisory committees, we are not allowed to initiate and create our own overtures or use an overture for a springboard for something different. That can only arise in, uh, from the churches, individuals within the church who go through their councils and, and then at that point to classes. And then if the class, the counselor or the, or the uh, classes does not exceed, then, then you can go further. But this is coming out of a corner and I think there's other precedents uh, in past synods that speak against that. Um, I would be very unhappy if I was from classes Zealand and uh, heard that what we had specifically stated we did not want to happen our overture was used to do that. Thank you. Philip Stell from Classes, Northern Illinois. Bev, following Be Bev will be Dean and then Paul. Bev DeVries, ethnic, ethnic advisor, a demonstration.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Bev. Dean? Dean Deppie, faculty advisor for this committee. I uh, endeavored to listen to our advisory committee, and uh, the whole committee was universally in agreement with the proposal that we need a study committee on same-sex relationships. With regard to the general issue of if we should look at the, the seven main texts in the Bible again, that proposal really never, never came up at the committee. There was no movement to go in that direction. So just to support the advisory committee as their advisor, I think that we are united to go in that direction. Now, what should we do with regard to looking at the texts again? Uh, a book has been mentioned a couple of times. That's the, the book by James Bronson, who is the New Testament professor at Western Theological Seminary. His book, Bible, Gender, and Sexuality, uh, is asking for a relook at the text and an overturning, a revisionist interpretation of the text. But uh, its publishing date is just 2013. It just came out. What would be the, the best advice to Synod? From my perspective, it would be that we need to listen. This is 2013. We need to read this book and for a few years just listen and look at the arguments. If, if we appoint a, a committee uh, that wants to relook at scripture and say in three or four years you have to report, then we'll have to come to some, some conclusions in three to four years. And I'm not sure that we as a denomination are, are ready to do that. We need to be more ready just to listen to both sides and to relook at the text. Uh, I know Calvin College is having uh, uh, seminars this coming fall on sexuality where they're inviting two people from different perspectives on this issue to come and just talk to the college and to begin a discussion on that. That's what I hope the denomination will do. Instead of uh, appointing a committee where we have to make a decision in three or four years to begin discussions at local levels, at our uh, college campuses, at the Calvin Seminary, to uh, be, read this book, to look at the arguments again, and then just to listen. Just to listen to our culture, to listen to this new way of interpreting the scripture, and just to think about it before a few years instead of wanting to have a committee that looks at the text again before maybe we're ready to do that. Thank you. Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul Verhoof, Classis, Alberta South, Saskatchewan. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this community. Um, I'm very happy that, uh, that there was enough of a set that we're going to go in the direction of a, a shepherding model following the faith formation. I'm very happy um, to hear what I think it was Brian Tebbin said in the back, um, that, I, that I think that might help us become pastorally progressive, uh, which I think is beautiful. I was asked, um, uh, never mind on that. Um, I, have no, um, I have no fear about the Christian Reformed Church in North America and becoming unbiblical. I am so happy to be a part of this community because I can't imagine us doing that. And so in some sense, I'm happy with A, B, or C if there is such a thing as a shepherding model for all of them because I think the pastoral piece is the most significant. If I had my druthers, I'd probably open it up open it up to the biblical conversation because for me who works at a university and for my wife who's the uh, who's the coordinator of human rights and diversity and is the chair of the positive space campaign where she's advocating for non-bullying for safe spaces for those from the gay lesbian bi-gendered bisexual oh boy G T T Q A A right the the, the whole community she makes space for them to feel at home 
And it would be helpful for us uh, to be able to be able to look with this community, to understand pastorally, to not be confused around our text. I ha- but I have no fear about the Christian Reformed Church shifting from our biblical from our biblical place. We are good at that. And uh, I, I guess mostly I just want to say I'm glad to be a part of you all. Next speakers are Art, Grace, and Chad. Okay. Grace, Chad, and then Calvin, and then Rodolfo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chad Steenweig from Classes Holland. Um, I, I love to echo just some of the concerns so far. Um, it, the, the cultural pressure that we have today in studying this issue, if we would set forth an, uh, a study committee to study the biblical, um, the exegesis and all that, and even, even within our own CRC, just in the past year, there's been an organization that has formed um, all one body with a purpose of um, full inclusion of LGBT, I think it is, um, within the within the denomination and their full participation. And, and uh, obviously, we need to understand the pastoral concerns. All of these things are things that we need help on. But when we have pressure from you know groups like that or from the culture or whatever, it, it, it clouds our ability to look clearly at Scripture. And that's what we need to be able to do as a denomination without any of this. So I. I, I, I echo Paul's statements that I, I, I trust that we would do things biblically, but there are external pressures that come upon us, and we are, we, we succumb to those as much as anyone else. So I just, I think um, I, I would vote in favor, and I stand in favor of the uh, motion from the advisory committee. Cal, and then Rodolfo, and then Yo. Yes, I'm looking at the overture on page 619, and the recommendation from the, by the overture is to expand on them in order to. Uh, one of the new things that we have available to us that we never had before is uh, an understanding of the causes of homosexuality. In December 2012, there was a compilation of papers, some four pages of references, that summarize our knowledge in the Quarterly Review of Biology, which is a peer-reviewed and highly reputable journal, a copy of which I have available here. And I'll just read you the title of this article, It is homosexuality as a consequence of epigenetically canalized sexual development. The paper is an important one. It summarizes well over 100 references that shows that the increase in homosexuality is due to an epigenetic cause in part and in large part Epigenetics means uh, influences of the genetic material by what surrounds it. So we have an XX chromosome for females and XY for males. If around those uh, during development, there is an androgen, which is the male sex hormone, or an estrogen, that will shape the expression of the XX for the female or the XY hormone. What we have produced in our society over the last half century, uh, and particularly in the last several decades with plastics, is the, is the release uh, into our environment and into every bottle each of you is holding in your pack. Uh, xenobio- xenobiotic estrogens, these are estrogen mimics. Sperm counts among you males here are about half of what they were for your grandfather. And this is due to the fact that you are being feminized. That's probably why you're getting increasingly peaceful at these meetings. (laughs) Uh, There are males who are developing breasts, children. There are children whose 
uh, genet genitals, the male genitals are diminished in size. And this epigenetic factor is very important in governing development. So when the classes recommends wisely that we expand in order to give guidance, uh, one of the things that I was reminded of is the walkway over the belt line. A friend of mine was killed before that was across that belt line. His name was Randy Gabriels. And his father and mother I comforted, and the whole Calvin community comforted. But what we also did was we decided what the cause of his death was. And the cause of the death would be repeated time and time again if we had no way to get across that belt line to the other side of the road. And so we not only gave compassion and counsel to those who were suffering the death, but we also looked for the cause and at great expense built the overpass. The biblical command for us is not only to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, but it also is to determine why people get sick and why people are hungry and to deal with the root causes in addition to the symptoms. This is a touchy issue because there are a lot of people who do not want to know that the plastics industry uh, is behind a lot of our estrogen uh, intake. There are European countries that have banned the use of the very products we all have consumed today in the cafeteria, in the drinking of our water, and we are gradually being feminized. That is unbiblical, I believe. We are made male and female. And to alter that, knowingly or unknowingly, and we're doing it now unknowingly, largely, is something we must address. So I would suggest, in terms of how this affects us, I don't really care how we resolve this. But the committee... I'm going to have to call you to the point, Cal. We've got... And here's the point. The committee has to deal with causes as well as symptoms. Rodolfo, and then Yo, and then Tom. Mr. Chairman, uh, I prefer to be called Rod. Okay, Rod. I just wanted to take a step back. I just wanted to read something to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank the advisory committee for being brave enough to engage this issue. And I thank them for the incredible trust they must have in our denomination to also have the courage to begin a dialogue concerning this issue. I am in favor of the mandate. In my community, I've had several couples, same-sex couples, asking me to marry them. I'm in a rural community. I stand out very clearly. I'm the only Hispanic in my church, predominantly white church, Dutch church. They call me Vander Galinder. But when this same-sex couple came up to me, they said, you must understand what it must be to be an outsider. They thought that I would side with them. 
on some of their issues. Seeking pastoral guidance and care, they asked, why are we not welcome at the table? Why cannot, why can't we be a part of this community? We grew up in the CRC, but we're outsiders in the very community that we grew up in. Our parents are confused as to whether they should engage us, and the elders have but written us off. That's in the community they grew up in. As a minister, I have many questions. I have faith in a God who asks us to trust him, to come with him with requests and petitions. And I believe this is one of those requests we can bring to him, that we can faithfully study a subject like this and be all the better for it, that we do not need to be afraid to engage issues like this, but that we can engage and be able to speak gospel truth into a very broken world, to a community that desperately needs to hear it. And I ask, as a pastor, as a colleague, and with many of you as a friend, not to say no to an issue and stop dialogue, but I encourage you and urge you prayerfully in petition to the Lord to consider the brokenness in our surrounded communities that desperately need to hear a word of grace. To a broken justice system, a broken justice system who also needs to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and to people in California all the way to the East Coast who are right now waiting on Supreme Court decisions, we need to have a witness and an answer and be willing to stand up and engage this issue so we can clearly, with dignity and with integrity, as ministers of the Christian Reformed Church have with one voice, say that we stand with the scriptures to the and point, we please, Rod, um, we need to stick to the recommendation itself. Yeah. I recommend that to please engage this issue. Yo. Yo, Scouten, uh, BC Northwest. As I listen to the conversation, um, my sense is that one journey ended this year, the Faith Formation Committee six-year journey. I think another journey has to begin this year. It's going to be a journey that's going to be very difficult. I'm not eager to go on the journey in many ways, but I think our denomination should commit to another five or six year study committee, shepherding committee, whatever you want to call it. Study the word, listen to people, but we have to engage these issues as we can hear. The issue is very important to us. So I would vote against this recommendation and for a larger mandate for this study committee. Tom? Mr. Chairman, I want to speak in favor of the recommendation. If you will allow just a, a couple of comments. Gently, 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 I want to say this has been a tremendous Senate of grace and truth and blending them together. And I would urge us uh, to be cautious of saying truth is found in certain generations and perhaps truth changes. It doesn't. I don't think we also cave in to pressure from society. I don't think we cave into suspicions that may or may not be founded. But I do think we engage in truth and in grace. As I read the overtures, and I wonder if it's possible if they could be put on the screen, it would be difficult for me to hold something in my hand. It gives a pretty broad response of saying to examine,
the overtures. It calls us again to, um, I'm sorry, the, the recommendations of the, the recommendation. We have the recommendation up on the screen that um, we are looking at. That's recommendation that's two, possible. three, B, two. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll go on. Okay. The recommendation of the study committee says to give guidance and clarification of how members, clergy, and churches can apply the biblical teachings reflected in the Acts of Synod 1973 and also the report to, 2000, or to Synod 2002 in light of same-sex marriages and the like. So it is saying that we have to go back and we have to give guidance and clarification based on the scripture passages that were used. Of course we have to go back to the scriptures if we are going to give guidance and clarification. Later on it talks in terms of identifying resources and best practices that will facilitate ministry and directly communicate to them in churches. I would think our number one resource, the best resource, is the scriptures. And from there everything else flows. We ought not to be afraid of saying, of course we are including the scriptures as we re revisit the issue and make pastoral recommendations from it. Thanks. My words are this. I don't think we can say that by revisiting this, we are concluding that we are going to change our stance. I did not hear our young people say that. I heard them say they are looking for guidance. And if I could add my voice to theirs, I too am looking for guidance. I've been privileged to serve on a Christian ministry involving homosexuals. As they have read some of our reports, they say things to me like, if you talk in terms of loving the sinner and hating the sin, it just doesn't cut it. Because we are so identified with our sexuality that we hear you hate us. Those are from some Christian brothers and sisters. I too need some guidance. I too would appreciate some clarifications and help. I believe that the recommendations of our advisory committee allow that, take us in that direction, and I urge our voting for it. Next speakers are George, Jose, and Steve. Mr. Chairman, our rules for synodical procedure, page 15 of them, um, under point C on the bottom under uh, Roman numeral eight, uh, a motion to amend says, this is a pr proposal to alter a main motion in language or in meaning before final action is taken on the motion. Uh, Therefore, I think in, this is in accord with normal parliamentary procedure. I think Sean Baker's motion is very much in order then, and the best and clearest way of testing the issue of whether the reexamination of biblical material should be included in the mandate of this committee is uh, to move Sean Baker's amendment now and I so do. Okay, uh, that has been moved and supported. George, the simplest way is to move to table the other one to go to, to this, so. Uh, but either way, I, you know, it really doesn't matter. We can get there by going around the circle one way or going around the circle the other. You're moving it as, a motion, as an amendment And um, the advisory committee has already suggested that they think. Well, we think the addition of uh, following the shepherding model is a friendly men, uh, uh, amendment. But, um, 
that, that's been added. Right. But the suggestion now is to move the other amendment, which has been proposed by Sean Baker. Can you read it again a minute so that I can... Uh... It includes re-evaluate okay. the biblical teachings yeah. relevant to homosexuality, human sexuality, and marriage. Yeah, Mr. To Chairman, add that. I, I really think, I judge that to be a substitute motion to ours because it does not really adhere to the request of the overture. Uh, okay. So Ms. It, it changes the meaning, indeed, and that's what amendments are designed to do, and that's what our rules of procedure say are in order. And again, I'd reiterate that it changes it so significantly that it becomes a substitute motion. So what we're going to do, because, like I said, you can go around the circle one way or around the circle the other way, and this just makes things very simple because we're going to leave it to the delegates to decide. We're going to take that as a motion to table the recommendation that we have before us from the advisory committee in order to consider the recommendation from Sean Baker. That, in effect, would get at what you're looking for. Joel. I wonder if I could just ask a question. I heard you say a minute ago that this amendment would be to add the first bullet in Sean's proposal. Is that what you're suggesting? Help me to understand if there's a, any other difference between what Sean's proposed amendment reads and that of the advisory committee. Maybe Sean would yeah. know. I, let me ask one more question, then you can talk about that, too. Uh, three times in that recommendation, I find the word re-evaluate and think what you mean is re-examine. I don't want to be involved in the debate, but I think we have to be clear about our vocabulary. Sean, is there a difference? We just got that, but is there a difference to your proposed amendment uh, other than that sentence when compared or put side by side with that of the advisory committee? Yeah, I actually, I formatted it uh, with, with nice bold and, and italics, but the, the, the form to submit eliminates all the, the rich formatting. Um, th there's, a, there's a few lines that are a little bit different uh, in the paragraph that begins this study committee, uh, but it, it's, it's basically just a way of setting up the, the first uh, bullet point that begins reevaluate, and uh, I, I guess I don't really care. I, I would consider it a friendly amendment to change that to re-examine. Uh, I, I want them to be able to look at it, and I understand that uh, mandates are very important. So to, to, to Tom's point earlier, uh, I, I don't think that a study committee uh, absent this particular mandate would go there, and I think it's, I think it's valuable to the church that they do go there. So this is how we're going to deal with it. The advisory committee suggests that that would be a significant alteration. We've heard the discussions, uh, many, many speakers. Uh, the motion, as I'm going to accept it before us at this point, would be to table the recommendation of the advisory committee with the intent to go to the substitute recommendation submitted from the floor by Sean Baker. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would rise to a point of order. Tim Howers, Iowa, Class of Zealand. It was an expressed concern of our classes uh, that this overture not be used as a means to uh, re examine and perhaps alter the 1973 report. And uh, I think uh, the words that Phil said earlier and Dean as well uh, speak to the question of whether it's uh, legally before Synod if this was not envisioned by the overture and indeed expressly written in such a way that that would not be part of our recommendation. And uh, so I would ask that it be de declared out of order. Okay. Um, I'm going to caucus with the rest of the officers up front for a moment.
synod is acceptable. Uh, this, we will not rule it out of order. So we are... I challenge the judgment of the chair. I have a great respect for you, Will. I think you've done a great job leading us. I love your way. Um, but I think that it is out of order, so I'm going to challenge that for support. Yeah. Okay. We, we have a, a point of order and then another point of order and then another point of order. <laughs> and we have to do this in a very orderly fashion. You need to understand clearly what is being challenged, and that is the ruling of the chair, which the chair has said is the unanimous opinion of the officers. I will surrender the chair for a vote on that. I want to be clear, first of all, again, about the challenge. I am Bruce Personnier, Central California. I'm rising for a point of clarification. I want to be clarified that if we sustain the chair, the chair. all we are saying is that we agree with the chair yes. that he ruled that, the, that we can table this motion. Yes. That that was legitimately before the Senate. That is correct. Okay. So yes is to sustain the chair. No is to not sustain the chair. We will vote electronically. Are you ready? Vote. The chair ruled that oh, an that was amendment was allowed, yeah. that we were not bound to the overture from Zealand right. and what it asked, that Synod could make up its own mind. The chair ruled that it was in order to make an amendment. That was challenged. If you agree that the chair was correct, <laughs> vote yes. Oh, yes. I want to make sure I do this right. <laughs> If you don't, vote no. See, I know, what I, I, I know the issue. I just didn't know what was yes and what was no. Thank you. All right. All right. The voting has has been done. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I have tried to vote yes, and the response tells me I voted no. Is, is the voting system working right? I've tried it twice, and can you check what vote is recorded for me on that? Because the email I get says I voted no when I hit the yes button and submit. Yes. No, that's Nick. So it says yes. That's Nick Monster. Let's go down for a minute. It's yes. Oh, it's yes. George? Okay. We have a yes. All right. The votes are 112 to 61, abstaining to. The chair is sustained.
Okay, we said at the beginning we could do this the complicated or the very, very complicated. It's getting very, very complicated. You'll be able to say afterwards, I was at one of the most complicated synod discussions ever. We are going to go back now to the motion to table. Okay, so there's a motion to table the recommendation of the advisory committee in order to move to the substitute motion of Sean Baker. That motion has been made. Is it supported? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary the same. Aye. That motion has failed. The recommendation before you is the recommendation of the advisory committee and we have Five speakers left on the list. Jose, then Steve, and then Mike. Excuse me, point of uh, technical capacity? Yep. <laughs> Michael Bentley from Classes North Central Iowa. Uh, two of us who have just uh, voted no, and we're pretty sure we hit the right little button. Uh, both of it came back voting yes on that last one. On the on the recent vote to sustain the chair, I just kind of revealed my vote. But um, yeah, please. <laughs> I'm going to suggest at this point that it's a moot point. Um, the sustaining of the chair was such a, an overwhelming majority that it just becomes a matter of principle then to, to note that your vote seemed to have come in wrong, if that was in fact the case. The computer may have even known better than the monitor, who knows? Just a point of clarification. Yeah. In Google email, if you vote twice in a row, it considers that a conversation, and it only shows your and it squishes the bottom vote, or the, your latest email in the bottom. If you scroll to the, your bottom of your email, you'll see three periods in a row. Click on that, and it'll expand your last vote. And that should show the correct way you voted in your final vote. Okay, so. that, that's, very, that's very helpful, because you know, some people say that when you vote, you should vote early and vote often. Point of order, Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman, that, yeah, that, that's a Chicago thing. And okay. West, west side at that. Um. Well, th that just goes to show now that that makes things complicated. When you vote too often, it just squishes you, and you can't <laughs> even tell what you voted. You have a yeah, point yes, of order? Yes, point of order, Mr. Yeah. I, I just wonder, because we're having so much confusion about whether we're hearing correctly and voting on the right thing at the right time, whether it's just a no or we... I wonder if we could do it all one way and just do it electronically. Uh, we can do that electronically. And, and the last vote, I'm not sure whether I heard whether or not the, the motion failed or... I hear lots of rumbles, but you know what? We all love each other and we're going to make it very clear so that nobody goes home afterwards and says, well, I still wonder or whatever. So we're going to vote electronically. The vote, okay, I know we're all getting tired, so hang in there, hang in there, okay? We voted on whether to table the recommendation of the advisory committee for the purpose of going to the substitute recommendation from Sean Baker. Hmm? And we're going to re-vote on that. So we're going to vote either. Okay. So. Maybe I should go vote too, eh? I hope you're clear on this. Calm down. Relax. Relax. Breathe deeply. Okay. 
you're going to vote. You're going to vote on whether or not to table the recommendation of the advisory committee as it's been presented or not. So you vote yes if you wish to table that. You vote no if you don't wish to table it. Excuse me, point uh, order. We, uh, I don't know other people, but the ethnic group, we don't know, we don't understand what we mean by uh, table kind of a thing. So, it, what okay. does it mean? Yes. Okay. And what does it mean? Oh, right. Just explain that. Uh, that's fine. I'll explain that. And I, I know you know what it means, but what are the implications, right? Okay, I'm going to announce the results. The results are 136, no, 40, hmm? The results of the vote, are 136, 140 say no, 39 yes, 2 abstain. That supports the conclusion that we had up here as we heard the vote. We are back to the recommendation of the advisory committee. We have Five speakers on the list. Uh, I caution you, perhaps, even just the results of that vote may indicate something in terms of the sentiment that prevails here. Please make your speeches brief, to the point, and please indicate whether you speak for or against the recommendation of the advisory committee. Jose, and then Steve, and then Mike. Jose Reyes, Classes, Arizona. I speak in favor of the motion that you have, the original one. Uh, and just a couple of comments here. The 1973 report has been, has uh, come up 12 times. Each time the report has been upheld. And we, keep, we need, to, can need to keep in mind the scripture has not changed. Uh, Overture 12 does not presume that the 73 report was wrong. It upholds it. And what it is asking for is for the application of the biblical standpoint that is already established. That's really, and just keep in mind that the right thing is not always a popular one. Steve, and then Mike, and then Sean. I'm a Steve Dozman, Holland Classes. Uh, my simple point is mute, unless I first have some clarification on is George Monsma's amendment still out there? How, just clarification regarding that. Hypothetically, it is still out there. Okay. Well, very quickly and simply, I just wanted to say as I listen to everyone and sort of discern a spirit, I think there's a lot of fear that's still present. And I think that's unfortunate. I'm not sure what we have to lose uh, by expanding the mandate, um, except for that wasn't Zealand class's intent. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but what do we lose by expanding that mandate? Are we fearful that they're going to come to a different conclusion? Is, is that what it is? I think to have the ability to relook at all of it and have all of the evidence on the table would bless all of us. So simply, I would encourage my fellow delegates not to operate out of a spirit of fear. Thanks. Mike? Uh, Mike Bentley, class of North Central Iowa. Um, you know, this argument keeps coming up, and I want to say that 
I feel really comfortable in speaking in favor of the mandate as it stands. Um, I, and, and to this idea, I don't believe that we're speaking from an idea of fear or speaking in a vacuum. Um, you know, I, I know that, that old things have been poo-pooed here in, in various parts of this argument. Um, I'm not afraid of a new document. I think the ones that we've had for the last 2,000 years have done pretty well and have spoken to this issue. Now, they're old, but they kept coming to the same conclusion, whereas science does occasionally come to different conclusions. Um, the 73 report was very interesting in that it, it, takes, it takes a stand. It takes a stand in saying, not fearfully that we can't have a dialogue, but that God has dialogued with us and has told us how we're made and how we do and do not glorify him. And I think 73 takes that seriously. So affirming that and going forward with a pastoral committee is the best way for us right now. To stand on that idea that God knows more about his creation than those who study the creation. We can take him on faith on that. The pastoral application of this mandate is exactly what we need to speak in love towards people who are hurting on all sides of brokenness. And as um, I heard from uh, Pastor uh, John Piper, not one of ours, but a reformed person nonetheless, there's not a single one of you here, and as the finger comes around to myself, that isn't broken in some way. So let's speak pastorally about why we know, what we know, we're already broken. Um, it's the application of God's knowledge that we already have, being applied in love, speaking to these issues, that is going to best serve us right now in this debate and at this time. Let's bring the tools we need to bear on the hearts of people in this time. I speak in favor of the amendment. We have two speakers, Sean and Chad. Uh, Sean Baker, Classes Grand Rapids North. Uh, I speak uh, against this motion and uh, in favor of uh, of taking up the emotion from uh, that that motion from the the, the Sean Baker uh, from Classes Grand Rapids North. Um, in, in my own experience as a pastor, uh, I, I guess I suppose I'm part of a generation that just sort of has assumed that because our experience with gays and lesbians has been so different from, I suspect, the way that they were experienced in 1973, um, I assume that when I went back to the, to the biblical texts, they, uh, they would change, that the conclusions of 1973 would be proved wrong. Um, and, uh, and I ended up having to undergo this study sort of on my own uh, without uh, as much help from my, my class, from my denomination as I would have liked. And so whether or not we add this to the mandate of the committee, can they at least recommend uh, resources that handle the biblical text in a way that we can affirm or recognize? Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's people from within our own tradition who are writing the books that I and my friends and many others are reading that challenge the assumptions of 1973. And I, for one, having done the homework on my own, have no fear that our denomination is going to switch its position. But I think it needs to be said again. So I speak against this motion. Chad? Chad Heisinger, Young Adolf Representative, Class of Siliana. First of all, I'd like to say no disrespect to elders. I greatly appreciate you. Um, I even have a hard time calling you by your first name sometimes. Sorry, Mr. Personaire. Um, but, you know, so, but yeah. And then we have this point from the young adult representative table. A few of us, um, Laura DeYoung mostly, helping me write this. Um, I'm reading from Acts of Synod, 1973, um, Article 53. I believe it's, it's on page... 52. It's under recommendations, point F. Homosexuals, especially in their early years, should be encouraged to seek such help as it may 
may affect their sexual reorientation, and the church should do everything in its power to help the homosexual overcome his disorder. This language is offensive. Disorder, based on new psychological information, even without changing our scriptural position, 1973 needs to be visited simply out of the grace and love. We heard we want to be pastoral. This is being pastoral. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of our speaking queue. I'm going to rule that we will vote electronically. That way there's not a chance of challenging the chair. We will vote electronically. I'm going to make it clear what you're voting on. The, the motion is that Synod adopt the following mandate for the proposed study committee. That mandate is listed there. It carries on to a second page. We don't need to read it all. It includes the point that had been added as an amendment at the end, follow the shepherding model of the Faith Formation Committee. That's the motion that you vote on. If you are in favor of that motion, say yes or push yes. If you are not in favor, push no. Okay, I'm going to uh, state that the recommendation has carried. At this point, the number is coming in 154 yes, 24 no. That has carried. Then there's one more recommendation that yep. you have. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Just, to, just a request uh, with regard to that. If anyone has a name you would like to have considered to serve, on the study committee, please uh, let uh, myself or Doug know, and to the committee, please, after we're dismissed, uh, caucus together so we can talk about names. So the quicker you get names in, the better it is. And then recommendation number three, that Synod declare this to be its response to overtures 12 and 13 with the ground. Both overtures essentially ask the same thing and as such can be addressed by the same study committee. I so move. Point of order. Yes, Nick. Um, because the previous motion mentioned overtures, or the two, two motions ago mentioned overtures 12 and 13, I'm wondering if this is a necessary motion. It might be a housekeeping motion. Uh, it certainly is not necessary to have a whole lot of discussion about it, I don't think, but it is, it is um, typical to say that the overtures have been answered. I believe I heard someone say supported. Yes, so the motion is before you, it is supported. <coughs> Don't have a speaker queue option. There are no speakers. All in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Contrary, the same. That is carried. And um, Mr. Reporter, we are not going to go into the next section. Um, it might not take a long time, but we're not going to presume that. And 
inadvertently we use the word emotion a couple of times. We're not in the right emotion at this point to engage, change our, uh, our point of thought and engage in some other discussion. Bill, I want to say a special thank you to you as the reporter because when we talk about emotion, I'm also aware of the fact that there was a death within your congregation and while you're busy with all of this and reporting, you're also thinking about a funeral service coming up and trying to prepare for that. Um, it's very difficult to do both of those at the same time and our thoughts and prayers are with you as you handle both of those responsibilities. May, may God give you strength with that. After that vote, we see Kathleen Smith come up on the, the speaker queue. Kathy, did you want to speak? I was just a little bit late, I'm sorry. Um, the overtures were both acceded to, so the final motion to answer them was unnecessary because we did answer them. That's all I wanted to say. I've got an update here with regard to Walter Brunsma or Brinsma. Apparently, uh, the word is good. His condition is stable, and he is being returned home here, as we understand. So, answer to prayer. We're thankful. Just going to look up and down the table here to see if there are any other, other announcements that have to be made other than the standing invitation that there are refreshments provided uh, by one of the local churches at Johnny's Cafe. Uh, we're thankful that a number of churches have taken the opportunity each evening to provide refreshments and so those refreshments are available at Johnny's Cafe. Closing prayer, Jolene, uh, you will lead us in that closing prayer. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at the usual time. Well, as I confess to you this afternoon, I love to talk, but I actually also love to listen. Because it's in the listening that I hear the voice of God that comforts, renews, and redeems. I judge right now both our minds and our bodies are very weary. And so I invite you for our closing prayer tonight to rest in the Lord and to just listen to his voice in prayer. Please come to prayer with me. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. I am the God who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. I am the God who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I am the God who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I work righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. I have made known my ways to Moses and my deeds to the people of Israel. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. I will not always accuse, nor will I harbor my anger forever. I do not treat you as your sins deserve, nor do I repay you according to your iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is my love for all of you who fear me. And as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. And as a father has compassion on his children, so I have compassion on those who fear me. For I know how you were formed, and I remember that you are dust. Father, what precious words these are. Abba, how wonderful it is to have an intimate God who speaks to our very hearts. And in light of these mercies, in light of who you are, we present to you all of the di discussion, all of the debate, all of the heavy issues that we are dealing with, 
and we relinquish our will, we commit this all to you, trusting that you will do which is that for our good and for your glory. We love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we do this in the most holy name of the one who died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ, and all of God's forgiven people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed evening.